Well, do you um, want to lead us in a word of prayer and then are you prepared with a Bible devotion? Yes. Okay. If you would. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to gather with one another, Father, even though it is at a distance. Father, we pray that you'll bless the services tonight, Father, that you'll send your spirit down and uh, to teach us, Father. We know distance is irrelevant to you. Uh, you can teach in all places, Father. We pray that you open up our hearts and minds and give us freedom of speech, Father. Father, we just thank you so much. We know we are blessed beyond belief, Father, in all ways, uh, in ways we don't think about and realize, Father. I pray that uh, we do remember those, Father, and we remember why we are here, Father, and we remember who it is we serve and whose children we are, Father. Father, I pray that we give all glory to you because you're worthy of it all and deserve it all, Father. Father, we pray for several uh, tonight. We pray for uh, Grandma uh, and Ramona and Avery uh, and Aunt Mary, Father, and their uh, different health concerns. We pray for those involved in the, uh, in the car wreck, Father, that you would be with their families, Father, and use it to be a testament towards you. We know all things happen, Father, to further your kingdom. And we can take peace in that, Father. We pray for uh, Brent as well, Father. Father, we just, uh, we pray for our communities, our community leaders, Father. We pray for our country and our president, Father. We uh, pray that you use them to your will. And we know we can take peace, Father, that all things in the world happen because uh, to further your kingdom, Father, and to uh, further your will, and we can take comfort in that, that you're in control of all things, Father, that uh, you know all and control all. Father, we thank you again for being here, and, and your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're still in Proverbs? Yes, sir. Okay. We'll finish Proverbs three up here tonight and it won't take us too too long we're pretty close to the end we've gone through them, uh, about the first 20 verses and starting in verse 21 my son let not let them not depart from thine eyes keep sound wisdom and discretion so shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck and this is the second time wisdom is referred to about uh, grace to thy neck being around the neck uh, the first time was in Proverbs 1 and this chapter has a lot of similarities to the first proverb uh, a lot of the same themes run through and a lot of the same themes are consistent all throughout Proverbs these mirror each other closely and it might be worth going back and looking at uh, but it reminds me of a necklace or a locket being strung about thy neck uh, some people might keep a locket with a, a loved one they lost or someone close to them uh, and it's the main reason they do it is for a remembrance uh, keep it in close to your heart uh, and the thought process is, is similar here uh, keep your biblical wits around your neck close to your heart so they are not forgotten it's a very similar concept to the christian armor uh, that wisdom will keep your path straight and we'll get more into that here in the next couple verses in verse 23 then shall thy walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou allow, liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and they shall, thy sleep shall be sweet. And the other ones is knowing the foundation of wisdom. Uh, and wisdom is the path of righteousness. Is the path of uh, keeping the Lord's word. Uh, wisdom is necessarily mathematics or science. Uh, however, it's knowing the Lord's word and knowing his rules, knowing the laws, uh, and keeping those. And it's a side point here. Uh, that our, our main point is that our, our foot shall not stumble, that they'll walk safely, that the Lord keeps us close, and that his wisdom is... He is the foundation of wisdom, as is said in the first proverb. Um, but a side point here is that the opposite can also be said, that if we do not keep the Lord's word, 
or you can be miserable, so miserable that you can't sleep at night or uh, can't think that you have no peace. Uh, a lot of this times this is, takes place when we are in sin. Uh, however, when we are right with God, there is a certain peace. Oftentimes things will be chaotic and you'll have a peace about you. Uh, peace and prayer is one of the most peaceful times of my day. Uh, getting back on topic, God gives us peace, and it is peace that he gives us. He ministers to us through the Spirit, uh, and he gives us safety. Verse 25, be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked, when it cometh. When you read this verse in King James, uh, most translations translate it as the desolation of the wicked, leading you to believe that it is destruction of the w- wicked. Uh, however, there is some debate over this, and it's mainly the preposition of that there's debate over. And I quote, Scholars note, however, that this phrase might also mean something external. The ruin of the wicked mentioned here might reference to those times when evil people trouble the righteous. Uh, there seems to be debate on the preposition of the wicked. Some scholars believe that desolation from the wicked is more accurate, uh, meaning a persecution of the believer from the wicked. Either way, uh, it does not change the general fault of this. Be not afraid. Regardless of it, if it is referring to persecution, or regardless uh, if it meaning the destruction of the wicked, we should not be afraid. The Lord is still with us. Verse 26, For, shall, for the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. We have a special protection by God. Uh, Most of us have seen this in our lives, maybe near misses or very close calls. Uh, I can think of several times in my own life where it's been close calls. And that's just the things that I know of or can think of. Uh, God is actively protecting us. Even this day, in this moment, he is actively protecting us. He is literally holding uh, our atoms together. He's holding the world together. Uh, When you think of the largeness of the universe and he's created it all and and maintains it all and it's so huge that you can't even imagine our mind uh, really struggled to to grasp the concepts of space and how large space is but the lord created it and he maintains it Uh, and he's actively protecting us every day i said that we know of several close calls but there are close calls that we don't know of Uh, the lord is always working Uh, behind the scenes in our lives, things that we don't see. You might get caught by a red light and run a couple minutes late for work, but it might have saved you from a wreck three miles down the road. You just don't know. Uh, But he's always working in our lives. In the next few verses, 27 through uh, 35, and we'll end after verse 35, uh, they are more of Proverbs. uh, And for the most part, they speak for themselves. Uh, verse 27 withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thy hand to do it say not unto thy neighbor go and come again and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee we must be charitable and we must respect our neighbors similar to the most recent studies of John uh, we must love one another and we must love our neighbor 29 devise not evil against thy neighbor seeing he dwelleth securely by thee strive not with a man without cause if he have done thee no harm and I'd like to add here better very little did I lose you no, sir. You still there? Yeah, you were quoting better, and then you said something, and then it went silent, so. We Might didn't. be a bad connection. Right. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay. Verse 32. For the froward is the abomination to the Lord, but a secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesses the habitation of the just. Verse 34, Surely he scorneth the scorners, 
but he giveth grace unto the lowly. The wives shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. Very similar here, verse 35 to Proverbs 1, 7. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And this last verse concludes the uh, chapter here. Uh, as uh, the wise will prosper, uh, those the Lord's children will po- prosper. It might not be earthly possessions, uh, but it is spiritual. There are kingdoms. Uh, Christ went to prepare a place for us not of this world, of the next. And the fools, those who do not believe, those who uh, choose to ignore wisdom or or believe uh, wisdom is earthly, those who do not know the foundation of wisdom or do not recognize the foundation of wisdom being given by God, uh, shame shall be upon them. And we'll end here today, but uh, I do find it interesting if you go back and read Proverbs 1, how much it mirrors this third proverb here. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Brother Ray. All right. Thank you again. I appreciate your, your studies and your preparation. It, uh, the Proverbs uh, don't flow like a story. They're uh, individual often, and at times they don't seem to be connected, but they are wise sayings. Uh, much to be taken account of and thought upon. The um, passage that we're looking at this evening is in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 7 through 15. And uh, Elaine asked me, we covered this this morning, she asked me if it was going to be the same. And I'm hoping to add some or change it up enough that... uh, She doesn't uh, feel like it's wasted her time. But uh, this section deals with the Holy Spirit in great detail. And a lot of it we've covered already, and some of it will be a repeat. But our Lord in chapters 14, 15, and 16 is expressing his affection, his love, and his concern for his disciples, knowing that just within a few hours, He'll be arrested, and he'll be tried, he'll be mistreated, which is an understatement. Then he'll be crucified. But he goes on to say in this portion of Scripture that it was important that he depart. And the reason why he says it's important that he depart is so that he can go to the Father. And in going to the Father, the Father will send another paraclete or comforter in his place. So we read in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And so for them to receive the Comforter uh, is essential for our Lord to depart for him to go to the Father, for him to send from the Father the Holy Spirit. And as I've stressed in the previous messages, uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead that has a tremendous amount of input in our daily lives, in our Bible studies and in our worship, in our salvation, and the comfort that we receive from God and for the hope that's given to us for yet for the future. And so our Lord, again, very tenderly speaks to his disciples uh, telling them that they're going to be better off and uh, and ahead for him to depart from their presence and they have to i guess you might say graduate because he's expecting of them and training them and going to work through them in the establishing of the churches and we can say that our church is a indirect result of this training that our lord put his disciples through here as he was approaching the cross itself. And so he promises them a a comforter. And this word is a paraclete. And uh, the Lord refers to the Holy Spirit as this paraclete. But also Christ is referred to as a paraclete. And we'll look at these verses in regards to this. In John 14, 16, I will pray the Father. And, uh, And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you 
forever. And this word paraclete means one who pleads the cause of another, one who intercedes on behalf of another, also one who exhorts, defends, comforts, uh, prays for another. Uh, and, and it's the title given to the Holy Spirit by Christ. And so we find that the, the Christ refers to the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, in this relationship. In this passage, though, we see that relationship very clearly, as I pointed out in the past. The three persons of the Godhead are equal, yet there is a an order of, of authority, I guess you might say, in that the Holy Spirit is always subject to the Father and to the Son, and the Son's always subject to the Father. But the Father and, the whole, and Christ are never subject to the Holy Spirit. There's an equality, yet there is an order of authority that exists in the Godhead. There are three persons and yet one God. And this is a mystery that we will never fathom. I don't know if even in heaven we'll have a complete understanding of how this can be, but this is what the scripture teaches. John 15, 26, But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. And what is truth? Our Lord was asked this question mockingly just prior to his crucifixion. And uh, this is something that, that we spend a lot of time trying to get down to the basis of. Uh, listening to uh, a minister there on the, my Facebook that I posted his message, uh, he was talking about this, how churches sometimes are like Disney World, uh, points of entertainment, and that uh, the Word of God is, is uh, almost non-existent in churches. And he was a missionary for many years. He's very well known. Uh, he preaches uh, with the, you know, what they would call the, the big ones out, out there among the Southern Baptists. And, uh, but he was on the mission field in uh, South America and then later in parts of Eastern Europe. And uh, his thing was that Christianity in America is basically very polluted. And, uh, and he says the churches are full of people that claim to be saved, yet it has never changed their lives. It has not affected the way that they live. And he says it has to do with this easy believism that's been promoted in the churches. And uh, he was speaking to about 4,000 people, and he made the point, he says, I'll probably never be invited back. And this message was on a site called Some of the Greatest Sermons Ever Preached, and it was a great one. But he was pointing out this aspect about how uh, elementary Christianity has become in this country and how polluted it's become. And, and I believe that is very, very much true. And the idea behind going through the scripture and going in great detail and trying to open up scripture is to get back to what is truth. We, we think in terms of, of, and I've used this example before, but if you can think of machinists building an engine for a car, and one machinist has uh, a set of standards, and it's different from the other machinist. The other machinist has another set of standards that he likes, and, uh, and so they're building this car with two different sets of standards. And uh, they use these standards to adjust their tools, to keep their tools accurate. And so one is maybe boring out the engine with his tools, and he's measuring it, and it's accurate according to his standards. But the other fellow that might be building the pistons might have a different set of standards. And so he's making the pistons to fit inside the cylinders. And you can be sure that when they finally get the motor together, it either will be too tight or it'll be too loose and it'll be leaking oil everywhere. It's because they've used two different standards. Well, what is truth? In today's world in which we live, this person says, well, it might be wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me. Or it might be okay to live this lifestyle for me, but maybe not for you. And uh, your standards are not necessarily my standards. Well, it's not my standards, and it's not your standards. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is the standard of what is true. And we search the Scripture to see uh, what the, the Holy Spirit reveals unto us in regards to what is truth. And it becomes then the pattern 
or the standard by which we are to live. And so we find here that the Holy Spirit then teaches us what is truth, and he's referred to here in this verse as the spirit of truth. And uh, 16, 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Then Christ is also referred to as the paraclete, and we read this in 1 John 2, 1, my little children, and notice the way he addresses, um, John does addresses the people here. He refers to them in a very tender way. I mentioned to you that we had a family get together here yesterday and in regards to Memorial Day, and uh, we had many children. Uh, I would guess we've had probably six or eight children here at least, uh, maybe f from uh, about 12 years old down, uh, running all over the house uh, and uh, chasing each other round and round in circles. Our house is built so that you can go through the hallway and come back out through the living room in a complete circle, or you can go through the kitchen, and, and so the, basically two circles. And uh, they were going both ways, both patterns. And uh, our neighbor was visiting with us for a meal, and, and I asked her if it was bothering her. She has a, a uh, health issue, and she said no. She, she was a retired elementary teacher, and she loved to hear the children playing. And, and so uh, she said to me, I, I'm a very blessed man. And I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I think I am. And in regards to this, then, we have this tender feeling for these children. Our youngest one now is nine months, and, and he's taken a liking to me. And uh, he'll come to me, and he'll sit in my lap, and he'll pull the buttons on my shirt and take the glasses out of my pocket. And, and, uh, and I told uh, uh, this morning, I said, Elaine thinks that he can do no wrong. And uh, we tend to think that way in regards to our grandchildren. But our, we find here that John addresses these church members here is, uh, with this tender thought or idea uh, that is my little children of course he was known and it was reported that when he uh, was quite old approaching 100 years old they would have to carry him to the worship service and he would simply say love one another that, that was as much as he could get out at that point well I'm thinking again of our brother Cole there at Bible camp and he was in his 95 years old. I believe the last time he was at Bible camp and the children just loved him. And he would stand up there and you had to listen very carefully as he spoke. And he did, he visited with you all when we had first established the church. And as he would speak, uh, the children just loved to hear him. And he would stand up there and he would weep over the children and, and beg them not to do some things they have no business doing. And and uh, he was the favorite of all the counselors at the Bible camp. And he had this love that just showed uh, the stories, and I think I've shared this with you before. Brother Dale said they could travel and go into a McDonald's across the country, and someone has never met Brother Cole, and, and uh, he would put in his order, and he says they would come out from behind the counter and hug his neck. He had just that uh, uh, demeanor about him. And so... John here is addressing these members there, and he says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an paraclete. That's the word there, advocate, a paraclete, with the Father. And then he identifies who this paraclete is. Jesus Christ, the righteous. In other words, Christ is at the right hand of the Father, and he intercedes for us. As I mentioned earlier, the word paraclete means one who pleads the cause of another. And so any accusations that Satan might make against us, our Lord would speak up and says, my blood has covered that sin. Then we read in Romans 8, 34, again, in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ as the paraclete. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And so not only do we have the Holy Spirit, but we have Christ also then who pleads our cause or who intercedes on our behalf or who is our advocate. Then one more passage is found in Hebrews 7. 
verse 25, along the same lines, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, where we read in Hebrews 7, 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And, and so we have here then both the Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf and we have our Lord Jesus Christ interceding on our behalf. Verse 8 of chapter 16 of John, we have three things listed. Then in verse 9, one thing is covered out of the verse 8. Verse 10, another thing is covered. And verse 11, the third thing is covered. But in John 16, 8, we have, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. Putting this in context, our Lord is speaking to his 11 disciples. And the world that in general he's talking about is the Jews who have rejected him. But in general, it's the world as, as a whole that the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. And that part of the reason why the world hates Christians so much is that it convicts them, and it convicts them of their sin. And they change their standards by which they live. And, and they don't necessarily uh, know the Bible, they don't necessarily study the Bible, but they'll argue the Bible with you. And, and, uh, and they'll twist it. And the Bible talks about this. Paul says that twist it to their own destruction. And so he says here, he'll reprove the world of sin and then of righteousness. And we would perhaps use the word right. And we might also say balanced or justice in the sense that, uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit points out how we're off balance how we have a debt to God that we can never pay ourselves. And that, uh, the, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is able to make things right. He's the one that is able to fulfill the, the debt, make the obligations completed. Uh, and, uh, and so the Holy Spirit will uh, show how unbalanced the world is in regards to the things of God. Some had talked about destroying the Word of God and that if they could destroy the Word of God, they could destroy the, the belief in God. But then someone said, well, then you would also have to pull down every star that's in the heavens because uh, the, the creation itself testifies that there is a creator. And then the third thing listed here is of judgment. And again, this would, word would be justice or injustice. And how much justice or injustice do we find argued daily uh, on the on TV and on the internet and in the world and if you're dealing with young children it's, it's this it's not fair or that's not fair and, and they want justice or if you happen to be an American Indian you want justice or if you're African American you want justice and um, everybody claims they want justice well uh, this is a thing that that the Holy Spirit convicts people of and that is injustice uh, and that what is just, and we, we don't want just, I always think about the person that's standing before the judge and his lawyer stands up and says, Your Honor, all we want is justice. And the, the man pulls his lawyer back down and he says, Your Honor, we don't want justice. He says, I want mercy. And mercy is what we need. Justice is eternal damnation in hell. But mercy is that we have the grace of God who has cleansed us from all iniquity and has recruited renewed within us a right spirit and has promised us a place in heaven and has sent his spirit to well in our hearts. And so we don't want justice, we want mercy. And verse 9 then of sin, and I told you verse 8 lists three things, verse 9, 10, and 11 go over each one of these things. Of sin because they believe not on me. Uh, unbelief. And of course the major thought that runs through the Gospel of John that John recorded these things in order that we might believe, that is faith. But the sin of unbelief then is that which condemns. You can have the vilest sinner, as the thief on the cross was probably one of the most vilest people that, that was in that day and age, that he was worthy uh, of being crucified, uh, probably because he was not only a thief, but a murderer. And yet uh, his professed faith in Christ, the Lord said to him this day, shalt thou be with me in paradise. And so there is forgiveness even for the vilest of sinners. Uh, and, but those that continue in unbelief, and of course in John 3 it deals with uh, the poisonous serpents and the, 
the, the brass serpent that was raised up in the middle of the camp and that if someone was bitten by the poisonous serpent, they could lick, uh, they could look to this brass serpent in the camp and they would be healed. And so all it was was to look and live. And so those that refuse to look, those who refuse to believe, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and convicts them of sin. And of course, this sin is unbelief. And again, putting this in context, it was the Jews that had rejected the Lord as the Messiah. And so directly pointed to the unbelieving Jews, but indirectly pointed to unbelievers worldwide. Verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Well, what was he going to do there? He was to present himself as a sacrifice, as a payment that turned away the wrath of the Father. And, and therefore, uh, the judgment that was due to us had been poured out upon him. And he could uh, come to the Father and say, I have paid it all. It's paid in full. And therefore, justice would be that we would not be tried twice for our sins or our crimes because the Lord has taken our place and has paid it all. And in verse 12, I have yet many things. Uh, did I skip one? Of righteousness, verse 10. Because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And this takes us all the way back to Genesis 3.15, where it was said that one would bruise the head or bruise the heel of, of the one born of the woman, but the one born of the woman would bruise the head of Satan. And this is what took place here in regards to uh, Satan. Uh, Satan, I believe, thought that he had won the victory when he had the Lord uh, nailed to the tree and when he had the spear driven through his side uh, and, and he was carried off to be buried. And uh, Satan perhaps thought he was the one who had killed the son, the one who was to inherit, and therefore now he being the Lord of, of this world would inherit what Christ was supposed to inherit and thought perhaps that he had won. But with the resurrection of Christ... The judgment of Satan is sealed, and it's for sure that he will eventually be cast out into, into hell itself. And so we have here uh, in verse 11 of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And it emphasizes the fact of Satan as the prince. Satan is real, and he's alive, and he's active. Um, he comes uh, sometimes to us in temptation. And some would say, well, we're not important enough for Satan to come to us. Well, if not, then he sends some of his fallen angels to attack us because we do fall under satanic attack. And, and therefore, uh, we find here that he is uh, the one who is referred to as the prince of this world. I, I mentioned Ronald Reagan talking about evil empires, and, and the news media really went crazy over this. But he was talking about certain countries have... Uh, uh, are, are classified as evil empires. And this goes all the way back to the Old Testament where there were certain countries that had a evil angel that ruled over them and there were other countries that had a good angel lead, uh, ruling over them. Uh, and so this concept is very biblical. Uh, and if we would look at countries, we would say, well, Germany during World War II had a very evil spirit that ruled over Germany. And at times in this country, we might think we have a very evil spirit that has ruled over this country. Uh, our current president, I, f I find to be a, a breath of fresh air. But I thought the same thing about Ronald Reagan. And then it wasn't right after his election that the next president was a very evil man. And so we find uh, that, uh, that countries tend to have a spirit behind the leadership. That the leadership is the one that the Lord places. And we can be sure that Putin has been placed in Russia by God. We can be sure that the president of China has been placed there by God. Uh, the different evil countries of the world, Iraq and whatnot, their leadership is placed there by God. And the leadership that we will have in the next election and the one we currently have is the one that God has determined that we will have. And we think, well, we vote on this, we vote on that. But in the ultimate run, uh, run of things, God is the one who controls behind the scenes. And if we should get another evil ruler, uh, and, I should say, and I'm thinking in terms of previous presidents, then we can be sure that God has made no accidents, and he's given us, uh, if it's a trip to the woodshed, or if it's bringing down of more judgment, or if it's entering in of a, uh, 
time frame in which the world is coming to an end, you can be sure that he's in complete control. And they might think they're in control, but ultimately God is in complete control. And so we read here in this verse uh, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Then we look at verse 12. I have yet many things uh, to say unto you, but you cannot bear them or you cannot hear them now. And I'm having trouble seeing tonight. My eyes are boring over, so forgive me. Well, I'm going to try to get my glasses fixed here pretty soon. But we hear then that they're, they were not able to hear or receive the things that he has there before them. And this is part of what he promised them, that when he departed, the Spirit would remind them. Uh, the Lord was preparing his disciples to establish the churches, to set things in order, to even appoint elders over churches, and to exercise discipline when it was needed and to rebuke churches when they were out of order and, and to establish things. We do this today by the complete revelation of Scripture. But before we had the completed Bible, it was the Lord's apostles. And it was a major change, a major shift. It was a worship by sacrifice in the temple to now worshiping in spirit and truth. And, and it was verified and legitimized by miracles. Uh, this change of worship was established by God, and he witnessed it with miracles. And so he says, you're not capable of hearing these things right now. You don't want to hear them. Your mind is somewhere else. But the Holy Spirit, when I am departed, will come, will remind you, and will guide you, and will instruct you. It's the Holy Spirit that we are dependent on this evening as we stand before you to communicate the Word of God to you, that he will give me the words to speak, and that he will give you the ears to hear the message. And so we're very dependent upon the Holy Spirit in regards to revelation and the things of his word. But he goes on to say here, how be it, and this is in reference to verse 12 where they couldn't hear right now. He says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself. The order of authority here, in other words, he doesn't blow his own horn. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And then verse 14, he shall glorify me. Well, why? Well, that's what the scripture is all about. The center of all scripture is Jesus Christ. Be it the Old Testament or be the New Testament, we always need to look for Jesus. If you happen to be in the well of the belly for three days, you need to remember that Christ was in the earth for three days and three nights. And so it is, if you happen to be in the fiery furnace, the fourth like unto the Son of Man was with you there. And so it is that we have that the Spirit then glorifies Christ. He, promote, he promotes Christ because in Christ we have the gospel, the good news. We have salvation. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And so the Holy Spirit was going to teach the apostles, remind them of what our Lord taught and as our, we looked at the gospel, we see kind of a, an outline. But when you go into the epistles, you see the application of the outline. You see the enlargement of the teaching. And we might take, for instance, the Lord's Supper. He established the Lord's Supper in previous chapters. But when you come to 1 Corinthians, you'll find the order in which this is to be done and what it represents and what it stands for and uh, how it pictures our Lord and, and his holiness and his purity and how it then is enlarged upon by the apostles, by the writers of the New Testament, uh, by the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so the, the foundation is laid in the Gospels, but it's enlarged upon in the epistles. Then verse 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And for some reason, I was listening to a message this last week, and this passage was re made reference to, and it had to do with adoption. And it had to do with the fact that uh, when a parent has children, they divide their inheritance among their children, and a certain percentage goes to each child. But in our relationship with Christ, we're joint heirs. We inherit everything. Uh, and, and again, this is something that perhaps cannot be comprehended uh, by our human minds, but that we will receive what the Holy Spirit teaches us and he will reveal unto us and he will tell us all that there is. 
Another thing is that our Lord refers to his disciples as friends, no longer as servants, although they always refer to themselves as servants in their writings. But he refers to them as friends. And the difference between a servant and a friend in matters of things is that you don't always tell the servants what your goals are, uh, where you're going. But our Lord told the servants everything. He told them, this is what's going to happen. This is how the world's going to react to you. This is what the future holds. And this is your hope or your expectation in the future. And so you're not just a servant that is taking care of the daily duties that had to be taken care of in the kingdom, but that you're kept up to date as to what the future holds. And therefore, we place our heart, our mind, and our eye on things to come. And so we have here in this passage, again, a very tender passage that our Lord is dealing with in which he deals with his loved ones in a very tender way. And we look, Lord willing, our next time at verses 26, or excuse me, 16 through 22, which deals with Christ's departure and his return. And then after that, we have encouragement to prayer as found in verses 23 through 27. And then in verses uh, 28 through the end of the chapter, we have some things that our Lord reveals about himself. And so this is what lies ahead for us here in John chapter 16. We'll end it there this evening with a, a moment of any questions or thoughts or comments uh, before we dismiss. Are all hearts clear? Then I'm going to dismiss with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the tenderness by which you address your disciples and how we can infer from this that this tenderness extends to us, that you have a love for us that's beyond our comprehension and that our love to you is only in response because you first loved us. Bless now your word to those that hear. Uh, encourage us in, in your service and in your ways. And again, Lord, may we never take credit to ourselves, but may we always give you the praise and the glory and the honor. For it's in thy son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. If all hearts Amen. are clear, Lord will, and we'll see you all Wednesday night. And I'll try to have my mind, my A game together so far as knowing what time I'm supposed to be here. Again, I apologize. <laughs> Y'all, good night. The Lord bless you. Good night. Love you, Ray. Love good you night, too. Brother. Take care. Poor Ray. You still there, sister? <laughs> No longer. Okay, she's gone. <laughs>